I'm Dr. Ken Landau. This is Well Now Doctor. Thank you for joining us. We're going to be discussing Alzheimer's disease. Obviously, it's an increasingly prevalent topic of discussion. We have to discuss a little bit about what Alzheimer's disease is, what's the clinical symptomatology, why do people develop the condition, what can you do to hopefully prevent the condition, and then once the condition is developed, how do we differentiate it from several other look-alike conditions, maybe that have some different therapies available. And then, of course, how do we treat the condition? And, of course, is our treatment any good? Well, the first question is, what is Alzheimer's disease? Alzheimer's disease is a chronic, progressive neurodegeneration. So chronic, once it starts, it lasts for a long time, actually lasts forever. It's progressive. It's not a condition that just comes on and you have a little memory loss and then it doesn't progress to become increasingly more burdensome. And then, of course, it's neurodegeneration. It's one of several types of dementia, so not all dementia belongs to the Alzheimer's class. However, it's very hard to make the differential diagnosis between some of the very common types of dementia. We also know that Alzheimer's disease is considered one of two things. It's either considered a pathologic diagnosis, so it's a diagnosis that the doctor makes at autopsy when he examines the brain, or it's a clinical syndrome. Now, what are the symptoms of dementia, just overall? Overall, we know that it's a cluster of signs and symptoms. Memory loss is essential for the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease, but it's a lot more than just memory loss. It's a loss of what we call executive function, your ability to plan, your ability to organize your thoughts in a coherent pattern. It's problems with language. You can't speak. You can't recognize appropriate words. It's a problem with your behavior that becomes progressively more erratic. It's associated with psychological and psychiatric disorders. And it's associated ultimately with an impairment in your ability to take care of yourself a problem that ultimately may lead to your admission to a nursing home. What do we know about frequency of Alzheimer's disease? Alzheimer's disease is extraordinarily prevalent. It's estimated that once every minute in the United States, another individual develops Alzheimer's disease. And interestingly, fewer than 50% of all of the people who have Alzheimer's disease have the diagnosis established. Now, Alzheimer's disease is only one of several different types of dementia. Actually, Alzheimer's disease probably makes up no more than 50 or 60 percent of all people with dementia. We have to consider vascular disease. Well, a stroke certainly is a vascular disease, but people develop mini strokes or people just develop some problems with the blood vessels in the brain as a result of high blood pressure, maybe high cholesterol over a period of years. And then we have a condition that was once originally thought to be related to Parkinson's disease, a condition known as Lewy body dementia. And then we have another condition known as frontobasal degeneration, a problem with different areas of the brain. Well, here in the United States at the present time, it's estimated that probably somewhere around 5 million people have Alzheimer's disease. And it's estimated that by the year 2050, that number is going to increase to around 16 million. Now, if we look in the world at the present time, it's estimated that somewhere between maybe about 17 and 24 million people suffer from dementia, from Alzheimer's disease. And if we look overall at the prognosis, what's going to happen in the future? Well, it's estimated that by the year 2020, there may be as many as 40 million people in the world with dementia. And that number is going to increase to maybe as many as 80 million by 2040. Now, we tend to think of most of these kind of degenerative conditions as belonging here in the West, but that's not actually the case. We know that Alzheimer's disease is common wherever you go in the world. We know that it's common in China. We know it's common in the Western Pacific regions. It's common in Western Europe, and it's common here, of course, in the United States. At the present time, we believe that Alzheimer's disease may be the sixth most common cause of death in the United States. Thought that your likelihood of being diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease tends to be an older age group, 
So by 60 or 70 years of age, maybe 1 or 2 percent of people already have some of the signs of Alzheimer's disease. And we think that that number increases so that by the time a person is 80 years old, somewhere around 6, 7, 8, 9, or even 10 percent of people have Alzheimer's disease. If we look overall, beyond age 60 or 65, every five years the incidence of the disease doubles. So that by age 85, if you happen to be a man, your likelihood of developing Alzheimer's disease is somewhere maybe around 10 or 11 or 12 percent. If you're a woman, on the other hand, the chance of developing dementia, well, somewhere around 14, 15, 16, or even 17 percent. Now, if we look at the cause of disability and people over age 60, Alzheimer's disease ranks as more of a problem, more of a problem than more well-known conditions like cardiovascular disease or stroke or cancer. The cost of taking care of Alzheimer's disease, astronomical. In the United States at the present time, it seems to cost somewhere around 170, 180 billion dollars. It's estimated by the year 2050, here in the United States alone, the cost for taking care of people with Alzheimer's disease is going to top $1.1 trillion. That's $1,100 billion all to take care of Alzheimer's disease. And that's just the direct cost. That has nothing to do with all of the time lost from family caretakers, all of the other problems associated with costs that are not taken care of by the insurance companies. Now, we know Alzheimer's disease is obviously very important, and not only is it an important condition, but it's one associated with a marked reduction in the lifespan of a given individual. So if we talk about somebody who's 65 years old and has the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease, well, it's thought that the lifespan is going to be shortened by about eight years, or in other words, it's going to be reduced by about 70 percent compared to what the lifespan would be with somebody who didn't have dementia. And we know that, for instance, if a person happens to be 90 years old, the lifespan is still shortened, shortened by about three or four years, shortened by about a third. Nursing home admissions, very common in people who have Alzheimer's disease. If we look at the general population and we look at the people by age 80, let's say, well, on average, about 4% of people who are age 80 in the United States right now are going to be in nursing homes. If we look at people who already have the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease, well, that percentage increases to about 75%. So 75% of people with Alzheimer's who are 85 years old in nursing homes compared to only 4% of the general population. Significant numbers. That's where some of the cost is going to come from. Now, there's a question about can we make the diagnosis at a relatively early stage? Well, we probably can. The question is, should we? What's the rationale for making the diagnosis at an early stage of a condition that we don't really have the best of therapies for? Well, we can make certain kind of arguments. So, We'd like people to be able to get their finances in order before they start losing their mental capabilities. And we like the people to have the ability to make advanced directives or to enjoy certain things that they want to do in life while they still have the ability. We don't want them to delay taking pleasure. We worry medically that some people are going to fall, and falls are common in Alzheimer's disease, and wandering episodes where people leave the house, get lost. Well, we can certainly take care to prevent that if we have the diagnosis. Certainly, we don't want people with Alzheimer's disease driving cars. That can cause significant problems. We have to worry that people who have Alzheimer's disease, who are taking medicines, lose their ability to follow directions and take the medicine. So again, if we can do something preemptively, that might be helpful. And then, of course, we want to prepare for the future. What is Alzheimer's disease? Well, who is Alzheimer? Well, Alzheimer was a Bavarian psychologist, psychiatrist, and neurophysiologist. And he was very famous, obviously. What he did was he evaluated a woman, Auguste Detter. And this individual had symptoms, and she died after an illness that lasted about four years. She had short-term memory loss. 
She had disorientation to time and to place. She had paranoia and hallucination. She had difficulty with language and with cognition. Over a period of the four years, she progressed to where she was bedbound, she was nonverbal, she was incontinent. That was an example of early onset Alzheimer's disease. She was less than 60. Well, Alzheimer's disease can strike in young people. It's estimated maybe about 5%, 6% of all people who have Alzheimer's have onset prior to age 60 or 65. Tends to run in families in those cases. At the autopsy of Miss Detter, well, there was brain atrophy. The brain had shrunk. There were tangled bundles of what we call neurofibrils scattered throughout. And then there was an accumulation of a substance that they didn't really know about at the time. Now, what do we know about who is likely to develop Alzheimer's disease? Well, age seems to be the primary risk factor. As I said before, it tends to occur after age 60 or 65, and every five years it doubles in incidence. It seems to affect women slightly more commonly than men, but there's no ethnicity to the disease. There's no national differentiation. It occurs throughout the world. We've heard so much about head injuries with boxers, with people who fall, with people who bang their head. Well, all of that is apparently true. That does further the likelihood of degeneration inside the brain. And then there's a major problem with genetics. If you have other family members, well, then your risk for developing Alzheimer's disease is unquestionably greater. And we know that there are different genes that affect people who are relatively young and people who are relatively old. So we have one set of genes affecting the people less than age 60 or 65 and another set of genes affecting people who are more than age 60 or 65. Talk about that in a minute, but let's discuss a little bit about protection. What can you do to reduce the chance that you're going to develop Alzheimer's disease? Well, unfortunately, we know aging, right? you're going to age no matter what, but you can undergo or you can participate in significant physical activity. So the more physical activity people engage in, it seems the better off they are for any number of reasons. We also know that appropriate diet seems to be very critical. Maybe the Mediterranean diet is the best going. We know that if you have or if you can reduce the cardiovascular risk factors, the typical risk factors that you would have for a heart attack, then you might be able to reduce your likelihood of developing Alzheimer's disease or at least one of the dementias and you also reduce your likelihood of a stroke or carotid stenosis, narrowing of the carotid arteries if you reduce the chance that you're going to have diabetes or impaired glucose tolerance. If you do not develop peripheral atherosclerosis, hardening of the arteries, if you do not have high blood pressure, if you do not have elevated cholesterol, especially during your middle life, then you reduce the chance that you're going to develop Alzheimer's disease. Now, while those conditions seem to be important in middle life, as you get older, they probably are less important. We know that people talk about the benefits of alcohol. If you drink too much alcohol, you're going to put yourself at risk. So if you're a man, maybe two drinks max a day. If you're a woman, one drink probably is the maximum. Over that, we know that alcohol is toxic to the brain. We know that cigarette smoking is a major problem. It starves the brain of oxygen. It causes an increased incidence of atherosclerosis, hardening of the arteries. Also, we know that atrial fibrillation is a problem, problem increasing as we grow older. And we know there are certain kinds of chemicals inside the blood maybe fibrinogen, chemicals like that that lead to stroke, lead to other kind of problems associated with clotting inside the vessels. Well, there's talk about aspirin and the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, naproxen, Motrin, ibuprofen, drugs like that. Maybe they can help reduce the likelihood of inflammation in the brain, if they can reduce inflammation in the brain. Maybe they'll be able to cut down on the likelihood that you'll progress to Alzheimer's disease. Social activity seems to be important. Get out, associate with friends, do things learn things, the more you use your brain, perhaps the more reserve you can develop. And then even if you do start to lose some of your neurons, maybe it's not going to be as essential. There's a question about estrogen. Does estrogen help or does estrogen hurt, especially in the postmenopausal age group? 
Well, mental activity is apparently something that can be done. Mental activity, go learn a new language, go and do crossword puzzles. All of those things seem to be important because what they do is they increase the cognitive reserve. That's what education does. The more cells you have, the more activity they have, and the more plasticity you have inside the central nervous system, then when you begin to lose things, you're losing from on high coming down rather than from starting at a relatively low level of reserve. If you start with a low level of reserve, then you may well have more problems. So the lifetime expression of interest and occupation and leisure time activities, all very important. We know that some people have hard wiring. Their brain is wired differently, and as a result of the brain being wired differently, those people can lose more cells and not have symptoms develop. And then we know you have cognitive reserve. That's individually developed. The cognitive reserve has to do with your activities during life, your intellect. Well, a lot of people say that there are brain games that you can do that will help. You hear them advertised all the time. We don't really know that they're really all that important or even helpful. Cognitive stimulation, don't know anything about that, whether it really is good or not. Some people say the statins, those drugs that we use to reduce your cholesterol, might be helpful. There is question about whether they really are. People argue about them. And then, of course, there's the antihypertensive medicine. If your blood pressure is up, and we know blood pressure is a significant risk for atherosclerosis, hardening of the arteries, narrowing of the carotid artery going to your brain, well, if we reduce the blood pressure, that probably is helpful, but again, it's unproven. So the bottom line is you want to keep your brain active, you want to eat healthy, you want to remain physically active, and you want to engage in a variety of social activities, and then avoid excesses, avoid excesses of alcohol, avoid excesses of tobacco. Eliminate tobacco altogether would probably be the best thing you can do. So that's what you can do to prevent Alzheimer's. Unfortunately, it's what can you do to prevent blue eyes? What can you do to prevent brown eyes? What can you do to prevent hair loss? You know, there are some things that just can't be altered. There are some things that you have the genes for. There are some things that are predetermined. And unfortunately, Alzheimer's disease, in large measure, is one of those things. And a genetic contribution to Alzheimer's disease, depending on the age group, may be as high as 60% often occurring on a background of cerebrovascular disease. Sometimes it's due to just one single gene that's abnormal. That can happen, but that's typically a problem in early onset Alzheimer's disease. So those people who develop Alzheimer's disease maybe at 40 or 50 or 60 years old, they oftentimes have a genetic abnormality, a distinct gene. Well, people who are older well, we don't have all of that information that would let us select a gene. It probably is multigenetic. It probably is a whole bunch of genes contribute to the disease. And maybe the disease has relatively little to do with genes as we grow older. Well, if we look at the young onset, early onset Alzheimer's disease, the condition that occurs in people prior to age 60 or 65, we know there are several genes involved. We know that you hear so much talk about something called amyloid. Well, we have a chemical called amyloid precursor protein, or APP. It's synthesized from some information on chromosome number 21. We also have uh, another gene, and it's known as presenilin-1. And presenilin-1 is on chromosome 14. And a relative of that is presenilin-2, and that's on chromosome number one. Now, if you have an abnormality in the presenilin-1, chances are you're going to develop Alzheimer's disease. Fortunately, relatively few people have this. But you're going to develop Alzheimer's disease maybe as young as age 25, 35, 45, or 55 if you have the presenilin-2. Then it's probably going to be an onset between 45, 55, 65, maybe even age 70. That occurs, these gen genes, these specific genes, less than maybe 5% of all cases. But if you have one of these genes, and if you have a mutation in one of the genes, 
then your likelihood of developing Alzheimer's disease during the course of your midlife years can be as high as 100%, and a sibling, a brother or sister, may have a risk as high as 20%. Why is it important? Well, the presenilin proteins, for instance, they are intimately involved in the breakdown of this amyloid precursor protein. They're important in determining what happens inside the cells inside your brain. Well, we have another series of genes that are involved in older people. And interestingly enough, the one that's received the most attention is the one that's implicated in cholesterol metabolism. It's called APOE. Now, there are different types of APOE. We have a gene that you inherit from your mother, a gene that you inherit from your father. Each of those can contribute. Now, the mother and the father can each have an APOE2, an APOE3, and an APOE4. So now we have six combinations. We could have a 2 and a 2, a 2 and a 3, a 2 and a 4. And it seems that those people who develop Alzheimer's disease have a much higher incidence of inheriting this ApoE4. Well, ApoE4, important again in the cholesterol metabolism, it's a chaperone for getting things into and out of the cells, and it's associated with the clearance of the beta amyloid from the cells and from the phosphorylation of another protein that we'll talk about later called tau. If you inherit one of the fours, remember from the mom, from the dad, you can inherit a two, a three, and a four, two, a three, or a four. If you inherit one four, then your risk of Alzheimer's disease over the course of a lifetime increases by 200 or 300 percent. On the other hand, if you inherit from your mother or your father both the ApoE4, so you get one from mom and one from dad, so instead of going up, 200 to 300 percent, now it's somewhere between 500 and 800 percent more likely that you're going to develop Alzheimer's disease. Now, there's a problem. We get hung up on these genes. We talk so much about the genes, we have to go study the genes, but we know that at least half of the people who have Alzheimer's disease do not have any abnormality in the ApoE4. Actually, if we look at the population, the population in the United States where in an individual has a four from the mother, a four from the father, well, it's only 2% of the total population. If we look at the likelihood that you're going to have just one E4 from either your mother or your father, remember that increases your risk of Alzheimer's disease 200, 300%. Well, that's only about 15, 16, 17% of the population. Now, let's say you inherit two of these E4 genes, the gene from your mother, gene from your father, the likelihood that you'll develop Alzheimer's disease can be as high as 50% if you're a man, 60-65% if you're a woman, if you inherit one of the E4 alleles. Well, if you inherit one of it and you're a man, your likelihood of developing Alzheimer's disease is about 25%, about 35% if you're a woman. But remember, even though you can inherit the gene, you don't have to get Alzheimer's disease. And, by the same token, even if you don't have this E4, you are at risk. So, what do we know about late-onset disease? Well, if somebody in your family, just family member, has Alzheimer's disease, your likelihood is probably going to go up maybe about twofold. It doesn't seem like it's uh, compatible with the normal passage or the normal linkage of things the way we talk about genes. So we don't exactly know why people get Alzheimer's disease on a genetic basis, but we do know that if you happen to have an identical twin who has Alzheimer's disease, your risk is higher than if you have a non-identical twin. And we know that overall it seems that the genes involved, and there are a bunch of other genes that we haven't talked about, but they only increase the risk of developing Alzheimer's disease over all these other genes, maybe about 20%, 30%, 40%, 50%. So they're not really terribly involved. Now, when we talk about Alzheimer's disease, we talk about a condition that we diagnose principally on the basis of 
what kinds of symptoms a person has? Well, we have to have some core criteria. And we'll discuss what those core criteria are. And then, not only do we have to have the core criteria, you have to have some of the symptoms of Alzheimer's disease, but they have to be progressive. They have to be progressive over months or years. It's not a static condition. It doesn't develop and then not progress. Unfortunately, Alzheimer's disease is progressive in everyone who has the disorder. It might have some rest period, but it is a progressive, a chronic progressive disease. And we know that it has to be associated with cognitive decline. The big three symptoms are memory loss, inability to use language, and inability to use the eyes and the space and orient things and recognize things and respond appropriately to things. So the initial and the most prominent deficits in Alzheimer's disease are in learning, in remembering new information, in being able to process what somebody is saying or what you're reading. It's the inability to recognize faces or objects, the inability to reason and use judgment to make appropriate decisions. We call that the executive function. Inability to problem solve. Now we talk about Alzheimer's disease and we talk about the different kind of presentations. Well, in one group it might be language and recall and learning. Another, it might be the visual spatial realm where people can't recognize objects. Might have to do with not being able, oh, that's a pen. You can't recognize that it's a pen. Give me a pen. I don't know what a pen is. Face recognition, you don't recognize an individual, you don't recognize your spouse. Also the executive reasoning, as I said. Well, if we talk about probable Alzheimer's disease, you have to have those symptoms that we just mentioned. But then we say, well, we want to have some kind of an evidence that the process is actually there. So in the United States, we make lots of diagnoses based on laboratory abnormalities. So we have biomarkers that we can measure. Now, these aren't great biomarkers, but we can do an MRI of the brain and find that the brain is shrinking. Not only do we find the brain is shrinking, we find that specifically in the hippocampus, that's an area of the brain, that we find in the temporal lobe, and it is reduced in size. We also can do other tests. We can do the PET scan, the standard PET scan, and we find basically the same kind of information. We find that there is lower use of glucose, of sugar. The brain isn't metabolizing as rapidly because there are fewer cells. And then we can find that with some special kind of material, we can find that it binds to amyloid inside the brain, so we can do what's known as a Pittsburgh Compound D type PET scan. And that gives us an information on what's happening with the amyloid. But as we'll talk about over a period of time, amyloid is one of those things that we talk a lot about and know very little about. We don't know that amyloid is really essential in the induction or progression of Alzheimer's disease. And we know that a lot of people have amyloid in their brains, amyloid deposits, who are perfectly normal, who are never going to suffer any kind of symptoms. Kind of like MRI of the back. Almost everybody has an abnormal MRI, but relatively few people have low back pain. Well, getting back to the story with Alzheimer's disease, we also can monitor through spinal taps what's happening so we can find a person has the development of something perhaps called beta amyloid, and we can find that, and we measure what's known as beta amyloid 42 in the brain. That happens to be relatively low in people who have Alzheimer's disease. Or we can measure another chemical, another protein called tau, T-A-O, and tau in total is increased in the cerebrospinal fluid. And it just so happens that through a variety of different enzymes, phosphorus, the enzyme or the, the chemical phosphorus is deposited on the tau. And when the phosphorus is deposited on tau, then we call it hyper phosphorylated tau, that seems to be increased considerably in people who have Alzheimer's disease. So what do we do? Well, we want to make the diagnosis on people who have those core symptoms. We want those core symptoms to be progressive, must be progressive, so we do repeated testing. 
and then sometimes we look for some of the genetic abnormalities. Well, we can get very sophisticated and we can do other kind of testing, but that's really not necessary. Now, sometimes, according to the governmental agencies that, that sort of make the diagnoses, we know that we can make the diagnosis of possible Alzheimer's disease. People who have the same kind of core symptoms, but they have sudden onset of the disease. Remember, Alzheimer's comes on gradually, slowly, and it's progressive. Well, maybe in the possible Alzheimer's disease, it comes on very rapidly, and it doesn't seem to be very progressive.